Just remember that the Bible is a book of redemptive history. It doesn't include all of history. Only those things that are pertinent to God's redemptive plan. It's comprised of 66 books that are divinely inspired to bring those books into existence using human articles. It's divided into two testaments, the Old and the New. And in those two testaments, what we found was God's unfolding plan perfectly joined together as one total prayer using people and events, places, and even kingdoms to evoke us one central figure, and that is Jesus Christ. You can see this introduction in the book that you have. And as we hear Jesus Christ, what we see through the pages of Scripture is this. We see what God has done for us through Him. It has just divided the birth of our Lord. It has put us back from the slavery of the sin that we found ourselves into and has done that for our own time. And the Bible tells that story from beginning to end. And the subject from the very first page in the book of Genesis to the last in the book of Revelation. I have one subject in mind. That subject is Jesus Christ. It's not trying to see in the Old Testament, but as we go into the pages of the New Testament, what was concealed in the Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament. And so this story begins there, many years before that time, in the Old Testament. In the Testament, the first of God's will, it has never agreed or covenant for the disposition of benefits payable upon death. That's what it's talking about. We've heard the term last will in the Testament. This is God's last will in the Testament, and that begs the question, in order for benefits to be paid, somebody has to die, but it's God's covenant, how can God die? Well, as we begin to look at the Old Testament through those 39 books, what we see is that there are many deaths for the sacrificial system, but by the time we get to the New Testament, we find that every single one of those sacrifices point to one single final sacrifice, the sacrifice that Jesus paid for us. As a matter of fact, in the pages of the Old Testament, we say that every feast and every fast and every Sabbath and every event and every act all relate in some way and point to Jesus. Every prophet like Adam, who was the first man, point to Jesus, God's created son who fell short. In this case, Jesus is the second Adam. Adam fell, he sinned, and yet God's Primary son, his main son, his only beloved son, his unique son. Now, this is the case that Adam brought upon man. In fact, Joseph, and now he serves his brothers. In fact, Moses, and now he is a law giver. In fact, Aaron, and now he is a high priest. In fact, David, and now he is a king to be revealed of all of God's people. All of this is in my opinion, a picture of Jesus. After all, history. It's his story. Did you know that? History is history. Of course, on the pages of history, we see first story of redemption and God's life for us and so as we turn the pages. We begin in the Old Testament with those three different types of literature. The first set of two are historical. Of those historical books, the second time, the first five, all the Pentateuch, the books of Moses, Genesis, the Bible, and the Bible, the Foundation. Then comes the history books, the Foundation of God's people. Then we have the political books, the Father of God, and now they find the hands between um, the history and the prophets, which brings us to that last section, the prophetical books, some of the prophets. All pointing to Jesus, 12 minor prophets because they wrote this, 
I like to know that Jesus is in anticipation of the better day. And that's where the Old Testament leads us. So tonight, we're going to go back, and we're going to be going up to the day. And I'm going to have a summary of each book in the Old Testament outlined for you in the book. And essentially, I'm just going to go through each book. And when I get through the first five, we'll pause for a question and answer time. And then we'll move on. And we'll see how far we'll get to it. So I'll show you how the Old Testament begins with the portrait of the whole book of Moses. So I'm going to sign this. Jesus is the first book of the Bible, and it's a book of beginning for origins. It records the creation, you know, the universe, the earth, man, and everything that's in the world. As a matter of fact, it tells of the creation of everything but God, who has always existed. It tells us about man's faith and grace. That's where we found the story of Noah and the flood. We also find the story of the Tower of Babel, when all mankind collectively exalted themselves against God and God dispersed them, and that's why we got the nations of the earth. Every the nations of the earth, the second part of Genesis from chapter 12 on to chapter 15, we see God's plan to redeem what man had failed. And then, as it unfolds in the rest of the book of Genesis and ultimately the rest of the Old Testament, and how God does it is, He chooses a man. That man is Abraham. And Abraham has a son. His name is Isaac. He's the son that God promised to Abraham and Sarah when they were old and then able to have children. But God had a promise to Abraham. He said, I'm going to give you many. It would be a great day for you to give you a reason to live on. If you would bless all those that bless you, I'm going to kiss all those that bless you, and then you know you will be great and remembered forever. And so the patriarchs, the last four individuals in the book of Genesis, Abraham, the son, Isaac, the Hussein, Jacob, was never a chance by God to Israel. Jacob and Israel's twelve sons who formed the twelve tribes of Israel came into existence in the book of Genesis. And one of those sons, we find um, this story recorded as the book of Genesis ends. Now, I can know the most important son of those twelve sons of Jacob is Judah, because from Judah a king would come. But God chooses in his history of redemption in Genesis to focus on one man named Joseph, the next to the youngest of the twelve sons. Joseph, as a matter of fact, is a type of Christ in that he saves his family from certain death because of the famine. He was in Egypt, where his brothers had sold him into slavery, and when a famine hits, so his family comes down to Egypt. Joseph, by that time, has been elevated to the second most important person in the kingdom, second only to Pharaoh, and he provides for his family. I had to choose a key verse in all of Genesis. It would be Genesis 17 or 7. This is what God says to Abraham. I will establish my covenant, the covenant that I've spoken of, as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants, after you for all generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. In Genesis, what we see is that God, in the person of Jesus Christ, is that promised Son. And that progress of redemption begins to unfold. God made a promise to Abraham, he said, You're going to have a son. That son ultimately would be Jesus, the promised son. Sometime passes, and the children of Israel, those twelve tribes that are all down in Egypt, they go to multiple, popular, they go strong in number, and that's where the book of Exodus picks up. 
when he said it's a Messiah, right? Of Egypt enslaved the people of God, the crowd of four deliverance. God raises up Moses for him, he delivers his people from four of his and series of ten plagues. From the tenth plague, that's the plague in which God is going to send the death of Israel to those of every household to be left on the eldest side of each of those households. The only way to escape is the sacrifice of a lamb and the blood of that lamb to be placed on the doorposts of the home. And when the weapons that saw the blood, so will pass over the house and life will be maintained. Life of the oldest son will be maintained in that household. But then God's the prophet to not see him after him, but not see him after him, to live with him, will be good for him. The son of life that became their constitution. God makes them a people at the foot of Solomon. And he gives them the ten commandments, which form the basis of all other commandments that God gives to his people. And then he says, I went to the garden of the tabernacle, because I don't want to be a God that's distant, a God that you can't experience first time. Build a tabernacle and have it come and dwell in the midst of where you are. And so Moses and the children of Israel now have delivered from under the mantle that I bear the tabernacle. This is the story of the Exodus. God delivering his people in its center in God's kind of redemption in the Old Testament. Now, when God told Moses to do this, he was on shore. Can I do this? And God confronts Moses from a burning bush. Moses says, not in any excuse, God is a true demon. It is not a demon of God's truth. Who can possibly do this? And God speaks from this burning bush that's not concerned. Uh, concerned, and God says to Moses, if you want to know who we're sending you, if the children want to know, if the king, if the father wants to know who's sending you, let me tell you who it is. I'm not saying that the Lord is the one who's sending you. That is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent you. You are the God of the covenant. You are the covenant. Uh, I will be, but I will be. In other words, God is the eternal, existent God that desires to have a relationship with you and I. And I said, He will be all that He needs you to be. Whatever it is that you need him to do, whatever it is that you need him to do, because he's in relationship with you. He is the Lord, I am the I am, and he is in the book of Exodus, I am Passover. And if the children of Israel get out into the wilderness, then God gives them a set of instructions to the people and to the priest, and we find those instructions in the book of Leviticus. This is how you to live. This is how you are to be holy. God gives them lives to govern. He says, I want you to offer sacrifices to me, and I want you to set aside times of the year as feast times. Most central of all of these feasts and actually fast days, in my opinion, is the day of atonement. That's from Leviticus chapter 16. Sometimes just go back and read. Chapter 16. It is the amazing story of what the high priest does on behalf of the people so that the people's sins could be rolled back for just another year. Every time, every offense that they were committed against God could be put on hold for one more year. On that day, as the high priest prepared himself, Sacrifice an animal, took the blood, went into the most holy place, sprinkled it on the mercy seat of the altar. He goes on. He also does a, a ritual with a ram that he sends off into the wilderness, symbolizing the fact that our sin will be separated from us. He takes the, the goat, or a man takes the goat so far in the wilderness that that goat will not be able to find his way back. That's what God does for us on the day of atonement. He separates us from our sin and gives us a new leaf of life. The key verse in Leviticus is Leviticus 27 and 8. 
multiply yourself and be holy because I am the Lord your God. I'm going to cleanse and follow them. I am the Lord. Who makes you holy? Notice you can't do it on your own. You have to turn to God. And God gave us all of these feasts and festivals and rituals as examples in the, in the Old Testament to let us know what it means to live a holy life in obedience to God, a life of faith and sin. Christ in the book of Leviticus then is depicted through all of this as our high priest, as he enters the most holy place to make atonement for our sin, to do something that only he could do, we can possibly do ourselves. And then I have the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers demonstrates Israel's lack of faith. So it's displaying the fact that they grumble against God and against Moses at every turn. God has just delivered them, and it's not long before they complain about that they don't have enough to drink, they don't have enough to eat, they don't know the God that they can see, and while Moses is up on that, somehow they're getting the Ten Commandments and communing with God for many days, the children of Israel are dead and idle. A visible picture of this God that they cannot see. You have to be fairly chastised for all of that. But it doesn't mean that God does with that, the Moses does with that, but they don't cease from grumbling. And God says, because you show this lack of unbelief, you're going to be made to wander in the wilderness until every person in this generation that I brought out of Egypt dies without ever seeing the promise of Him, the destination, the place that I promised to have in the book of Genesis, I'm about ready to give it to you. But this generation, you are so disbelieving. You are so ungrateful. <laughs> Even Moses fails to be able to go in. The book of Numbers draws its name from the fact that at the beginning of the book, a census is taken to ascertain the size of the army of God, the army of Israel, that will be needed once the children actually get to go into the land and conquer the land because there are inhabitants living in the promised land. God's going to use an army. He's going to use, in some ways, natural means. Any great commander wants to know the number of his troops. God is a great commander. He said, number your troops. Sometimes he doesn't look terribly on that. In this case, however, he does. And we have a whole book in where God numbers his troops. The third verse we find in this priestly blessing of the people. Numbers 6, 26 through 24, and right now 27. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And the fact that I have verse 27, it says, So they will put my name on the Israelites, and I will bless them. In other words, the priests will declare that Israel belongs to him who fights their battle. They can number their armies if they want, but it's God that gets the victory. And the only people who display this belief that in the end, as far as God is concerned, he has a plan and he will be victorious. The sad part of all this is that a whole generation has to die before a new generation can go into the promised stone. That's what Deuteronomy picks up. Deuteronomy means the second giving of the law. And basically, it is a recounting of the law from Sinai. In which Moses preaches three sermons. If you want to know how to read the book of Deuteronomy, do it as three sermons. What God has done, what God is doing, what God will do. Those are the three sermons. As Moses recounts the law. Now, who does God do that with Moses? Because Moses and Joshua have to prepare the new generation to go in and take the land. They were just children if they were even born at Sinai, and they heard the law. For the first time ever, but now that generation is going to be gone. And God prepares a new generation 
God is doing something new in this new generation, and He gives them a law. So the king of the earth wants to get into the promised land. The true verse is central to all Jewish theology, even to this day. Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5. So now, the fruit. Here is where the Lord our God is with you. Where is the Lord the God with all of your feet and with all of your soul and with all of your strength and with all of your other commandments in the Old Testament? This is central because this sums it up along with the Lord of Smith and Oki, which also is the Lord of Smith and Oki, and also the Lord of God and the Lord of God. Everything else was coming to me. So when you go in the land, if you forget a law, don't worry about it. Love God and love your neighbor, and you will fulfill the law. And Moses thinks that same before the hymn of the time to Joshua, the new commander. He would deliver his people into the promised land in the book of Deuteronomy. Christ the Son as the prophet who is like Moses. Remember, Moses stands up among the people and he makes this proclamation. The Lord will raise up a prophet who is like me. And when he does, listen to him. Moses was talking about Joshua. How could you follow Moses? And that's what Moses is doing. He's saying, Joshua is the man. But Moses was talking about someone far greater than Joshua. Somebody who would take the name Joshua, the fear, not a name from the future, not a name from the future, not a name from the future, not a name from the that Moses spoke about, that was one of his people. Into the promise land, after giving them his law. This is how you live, this is how you live, this is how you inherit the promises of God and receive his blessing. That's the penalty, and that's where it ends. So, we're not going to have any questions about the first five books. And I'll be careful to try to repeat the questions if you have any. I don't want to go too fast, and I don't want to overload. But I will go to drink a water while I'm waiting. Any questions from any of those books? Genesis, Exodus, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy? Listen, that's a lot of material, guys. I didn't have it all. There's been questions about creation, the fall, the flood. Okay. For the dinosaurs on the earth? It seems to me that at some point they will. What I'm referencing here is the fact that someone asked where the dinosaurs on the earth. I believe that the dinosaurs were part of the flood of order in some way, and that at the flood of Noah, essentially they were killed with all of the other animals that didn't make it onto the earth. I don't know what the Bible says about all of the beasts of the field and, and everything that existed essentially for it to come into the ark two by two. And I will forget that God also gave Mary the command that all of the clean animals would come in by sevens, which is a good number, as far as God is concerned. And uh, so Moses, I mean Moses, Noah wrote that the ark. But it appears to me, I mean, we have factual evidence that dinosaurs did at one time exist. The dinosaur didn't exist in my estimation as many years ago as scientists say that they did. They place that they millions of years ago. I place it not millions of years ago. And then they say, well, there are fossil records that go down so far into the soil and they will indicate that these Animals were very, 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 very old. Well, without going too far into it, let me say that if there was indeed a large flood, maybe even a worldwide flood in the Bay of Noah, earth, great amounts of earth would be moved because of the flood. If the dinosaurs died, they could be, their remains could be found at every level because they all would have died essentially at about the same time. And the mud 
you know, all of the other debris could have covered them up on different levels. As a matter of fact, you had the various orbits of strata of soils. Now, scientists don't necessarily say this. Well, you had dinosaurs believed to exist millions and millions of years ago, relative to the top, close to the top, where it should have been a less amount of time, and you had animals that were believed to have lived at a closer date down below. How do you explain that? Dinosaurs should be down here, and the animals should be up here. One of the ways is that a world bites them. Now, that's my take on it. And part of the reason that I say that is because what is happening in the scientific field is that they have, in the, in the time of the Enlightenment in history, the church fell out of favor with people because of its abuses on the people. And um, so science and many started to take the place of the church. And scientists began to think. Um, maybe things don't originate like we thought. And um, so we're going to begin to place a date on the earth that seems to go against everything that we already thought to be true. And um, a church leader developed the timeline for the Bible, and he goes back 4,000 years and says that's when the earth started. Science began to say, no, it was farther and farther, and it had to, to explain how these mutations would take place in all of these animals that would go from one type to another, from one species to another. That's called evolution. Some, you know, that's how scientists explain dinosaurs. The problem is there's no proof for evolution. Nevertheless, we have evidence, so I think that the dinosaurs, Steve, existed before the flood, and not as long ago as it people thought. Sam, did you have a question? Um, yeah, it's kind of piggybacking off of that. Uh, I've heard, you know, dinosaurs, they're reptiles, and once the canopy was broken during the flood, lifespan has decreased a lot. Reptiles just continue to grow, so the dinosaurs could have been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old at that time, which is why they got so big. So maybe... Right. Right. The next thing is referred to as another scientific um, explanation for what happened at the time of the flood. If you read the account in Genesis 6, 7, 8, 9, what you find is that it appears as though that there was a canopy around the earth of water that was protecting the earth. As a matter of fact, people lived around the earth, you notice, before the time of Noah. In the first, first pages of the book of Genesis, people were living six, seven, eight, nine hundred years or more. After that flood, it was more like 120, even though Noah lived uh, well up into his attendance. I think maybe even a little more than that. And um, anyway, I think it was called that canopy that formed a tropical climate in which dinosaurs could survive. Once all of heaven broke loose and all the rainfall and the water came up even from the earth, that's what the Bible says, the springs under the earth broke loose as well. The climate was not conducive for dinosaurs to continue to exist in a non subtropical, tropical climate. And so they ended up finding out. So if the flood even wasn't worldwide, it doesn't matter. The climate wasn't conducive for them to be able to live. So any of the other questions? And you weren't using science to explain this fiction, because it's not a science book. It's a book of God's redemption, but nevertheless, it makes questions, and we want answers because we're reasonable people. Any other questions? All right. Let's go on the other side and let's talk about down the historical books. Okay, we left off in the book of Deuteronomy where the people of Israel essentially camped out at the foot of the promised land, and that's where the book of Joshua picks up at. And that book narrates the conquest of the Israelites in the land and the division of the land and the twelve tribes. Remember, we had a map of the conquest. And where all the tribes settled. it. Well, that's the book of Joshua. And at the beginning of the book, before all the battle was going to take place, all the battles were going to take place, God encourages Joshua 
the first time I was in my mental space to have to lead the huge army of people into the promised land and to take it. And so God encourages Joshua with this two words in Joshua 1 7. This time, the very courageous, be careful to obey all the lies my son at Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Joshua, if you obey my commands, I will indeed give you victory. And Joshua himself obeyed God's commands for a couple of times when things were a little iffy, but God, but Joshua obeyed God's commands. And God gave Joshua the new captain, the new general, and his army victory on the land, and the people were able to possess the land that God had promised them. And in the book of Joshua, then we say that Jesus is presented, or Christ is presented. And as the captain of our salvation, finally, God's people arrived at their destination. They were safe and sound. But it wasn't too long before they faltered. And that's where the book of Judges comes in. Judges tells the story after Joshua's death. When the people of God began a cycle of sin, which included idolatry, Judgment of God by invading armies. The people then repent and clamor for deliverance. So, what does God do? He raises up a judge, that's the name of the book. And the judge conquers who others in bringing them, and God establishes them with them. Once again, peace, they can rest and they can relax. And this cycle, though, continues 12 times throughout the book. Every time God delivers them, after raising up the judge, they fall back into the same problems. All of them are idolatry. They want to do that to everybody else. They want to do things their own way. They fall back to the judge. Keep in mind, you're somebody's kid. I think that's the thing. We want to do things the way we want things to be done. And we always want to fail when we do that. And the two days for six in the book of Judges, Judges 21 25, says this. In those days, Israel had no king, no one to lead them. They forgot that God was to be their king, by the way. But everyone saw, and everyone did as they saw so. Or in another translation, says, everyone did what it seemed to be right in their own eyes. They just did their own thing. But when they got Judges, the people fell, fell. They had lost up a million times, the people failed again. They were continually doing what they thought was right. They didn't need another judge. They needed a savior king, and that's where Christ comes in in the book of Judges. A king who was indeed the ultimate savior. And it's in the era of the judges that we read a wonderful story of devotion. Found in the book of Ruth. It's set in the time of the judges. And the book tells a story of an Israelite family that finds a famine, and a man and his wife and his two sons go to Moab. Well, the two sons marry two women, but then something happens in Moab. And the father, the husband dies, and so do both the sons, and all the women left in a full line is this Israelite woman living in Moab with her two daughters in law, one of them is Opa, which by the way was supposed to be Opa's name, but it was misspelled, and the other Ruth. Not only was the mother in law, the former wife who lost her husband and his sons, but she said, I'm going home. I don't want to be back to home. Maybe I can find some help. Maybe I can find some relief at home. I have comfort there. And so she tells her daughters and all, go back home. Go back to your dad. Just go back to your old life. You're young. You can have a family. You can have kids. You can have something to provide for you when you're old. And all the best for that. But Ruth? She clings to her mother in law, and they both together go back to Israel. Where they run across by God's hand, a man named Boaz, who is a good and honorable man. 
And the one who knows the man of God that says that if a woman loses her husband, a family member of the last husband must to redeem that woman in her family by taking her as his bride and giving her an heir. Because women essentially were helpless to be able to provide for themselves in this case. But God loved them, went to the place where they wanted to be in the middle of their lives, steps up to the times, and as far as Ruth, they were like each other, they were only coming up with a plan to ensure that they get married and they do, and their lives go. Not just Ruth, a child, but also Naomi. Naomi was something that she became stern for the grandmother of this boss, but Ruth was a husband and a family, and ultimately, she was redeemed from certain destruction, certain death, because she had to do that for herself. The thing that she was a picture has been provided for her all the, all the while, by the way. But if I was out of the picture, she has to find another way. She has the plans that they are instructing to provide the redemption. The law in which a man is to do that for his family member is the law of the kinsman to redeem. The law of kinsman is to redeem a woman who lost her husband to give her to him. The law steps up and he goes on. And you know who comes from that union? Men and Jesse. I think she has a name named David. The great king of Israel. And it's all predicated on this devotion to her mother in law, which she says in Ruth 1 16, Do not urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Ruth had a conversion of heart, and God saw to it that she was taken care of. In the same way, when we give our heart to the Lord, we find that we have a Christ in the Son, a kinsman redeemer. That's who Christ is. The kinsman redeemer in the book of Ruth. Now, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, and 1st and 2nd Chronicles continue that story of this line of kings and the story of the history of Israel. 1st and 2nd Samuel are joined together. It narrates the establishment of the ministry of the prophet Samuel, because now God is raising up prophets. How many of Israel's first time Saul? And as witness to the rulers of the United Kingdom, God is going to take those 12 tribes and He's going to marry them into one United Kingdom. These two books, first uh, in Second Samuel, tell us Charles the Niles, the son of Niles first, and David's ascendance to the throne and his kingship. That was God's choice. You see the key verses there. And it's only going to say, who is or what is the Christ? As you see in 1st and 2nd Samuel, I would say that Christ and then it is the, the anointed one and the great king. Israel had the example of a bad king and a good king. Jesus is the anointed, the good king in 1st and 2nd Samuel. The story goes on in 1st and 2nd Kings and it talks about David's son, Solomon. And then after Solomon's death, the kingdom was divided. Israel in the north, Judah in the south, as we saw in our maps. And then God has to judge the people because of their disobedience. Christ is found in first and second kings to be the only wise king. All the other kings in some way fell short. They couldn't quite deliver the people, but God can deliver us. First, the only wise king. And then we can refer to Second Chronicles, and I'm going to stop there and ask if you have any questions. First and Second Chronicles, maybe it's David and Solomon's kingship, as well as 
the selection of seven kings in Judah's judgment in exile. First and Second Chronicles is written for the people who returned from exile as a way to encourage their faith. You see, there were spiritual descendants of David and Solomon and God had promised David that he was going to stand as God as over his people forever. But that didn't happen until after the 12 tribes in the north were obliterated by the Assyrians and the Babylonians took on the captivity. Judah, the seven tribes, or seven two tribes, now the number one, just named Judah now. And most they have to return from captivity. These books were written to encourage the people to have faith. It's a lot of hard reading and genealogies and so on and so forth, but really, it's a book about faith. Take note, God hasn't forgotten the promises that He made to your forefathers. He will come through on your behalf. The key verses, First Chronicles 10 or 14, and then in Second Chronicles it's 13, 10 a. And this is what the people say in Second Chronicles. As for us, the Lord is our God, and, and we have not forsaken Him. The priests and the Levites and the mind of Aaron, and that high priest that was Moses' brother, even though many others have forsaken God, they have forsaken God. And now they encourage the people to do their rest. Let's not forsake God. Let's follow him. Why? Because in First and Second Chronicles, Christ is the sovereign king and the glory of the Lord. To whom the priests and the Levites minister day and night. So let's not go into that. How many questions? I guess I'm not going to tell you, and you simply have to kind of learn it. So I'm trying to do my best to, to convince it. And I won't go much further. We'll just do three more books. Yes, Rob. And then we'll end for tonight. You mentioned in Judges, uh, people were doing their own thing, wanted to, wanted to live their own life that they thought was the right way and everything. Mm -hmm. And that's why God created the Judges, I yeah. guess. Yeah. Today, we are doing the same thing. Political correctness is everywhere. People are just wanting to live their lives the way they want to live without any... You know, anything to tell them otherwise. People are just wanting to, what I feel is the truth is the truth. Okay, who is God going to give us judges to set us straight, or is He going to be our judge? Well, that's a great question. Ultimately, and you could say that God is the ultimate judge of the book of Judges, going back to, to that book. But ultimately, God will be our judge, but in the meantime, because he is long suffering, he always gives us the opportunity, like he did, going to Israelites, the opportunity to repent. And so, when we ask the question, and uh, that's the comparison between the time of the judges and even in our day with everything that seems to be going on, and doesn't it seem as though the judges are put in place based on their political affiliation? rather than on their moral standard. Rather than their adherence to, believe it or not, the moral law, which is the Ten Commandments. If you take from any society the Ten Commandments, if you remove that from the society, the society will not stand. And every ruling that, for instance, our Supreme Court makes against those Ten Commandments, is one more more, if you will, in our classroom. I don't want to be prognosticating here, and I don't, I'm not a prophet of doom by any means, but I'm simply telling you the truth according to God's word. When you, when you listen the effect of God's moral law on any people, that society will not stand. God will, in essence, judge us, and will always provide us a way of escape. I believe that we're living in a day when God's judgment is already on its way and in part here. We simply keep doing things that are morally correct, and we simply keep putting people in positions that are able to do that. And that is a sad commentary 
on American life. However, let me say that man system will always fail. And so long as any culture like America is operating on man system, it will at some point fail, no matter how good its constitution is. A constitution was written so that it would be flexible, so that it could be interpreted. But when you have violation after violation of the constitution, we have a problem. The constitution has protected our rights as individual citizens of this nation, and one by one they're being taken away. And it happens very slowly. I do feel that the people of Georgia's they had their fingers free and they could do what they want. Samson and George is a prime example. Now, Samson was a great warrior, and this little strong guy that they could always defeat the enemy until a woman defeated him because he was morally correct. Samson is a prime example of where a nation or a people could go. And I'm not making political statements here. Please understand me. I believe this place is a place where political stances are taken, but I'm simply taking a moral stance and saying when we put people in position to denigrate moral law, we're in a very dangerous place. Think of the Ten Commandments. Think of what is being taught in schools. Think of what lifestyles are acceptable today. And you will very plainly see that we're a downward track. Now, the problem comes, in my estimation, not just with government, but with the church. Then the Apostle Paul in the New Testament says, Well, if there's any business judging out there, but what I do is a business, is this. I have a business to judge the church. Judgment begins in the house of God. When we can't even take a moral stand ourselves and be different from the world, world then we've let the world down. We haven't assumed the position of influence that we could have. So that people know that there's a better way. And how do we do that? By loving them, not by criticizing them, not by holding signs up with a bunch of fake messages on them, but by saying, look, I love you. And I'm willing to go the extra mile because when I was in Malibu, Christ loved me. And we fail to do that. And we look down our long religious noses and we forget that we're just as vulnerable as they are. And if we would step out into the place where they are, we might find that God will begin to work again, one part of a time. Not by legislation, you can't change anything by that. But you can by changing a person's heart. And that's our job. So, Words of no time before you accuse me, take a look at yourself. And I think that's what the church needs to do. We haven't left like Christ did. Anyway, what do you find? He's hanging out with sinners. They all ridiculed him the religious leaders, and they said, Listen, it's the sick that need a physician. I came to save the people that know them in trouble. You think you're all right, but you couldn't be farther away from me. Let's get out there. Let's show the love of Christ so that perhaps some could be changed and some could be saved. All right. Let me finish these three books and end for the evening with a song. Now we come to Ezra and Nehemiah and then Esther. Now, Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther don't take place after that Babylonian captivity. Of the southern tribes of the tribe of Judah. They are now under Persian rule, and under Persian rule, 538 BC, by the way, they get to go home if they want back to the promised land, back to Israel. Now, this story in Babylon, and so we went over in Persia. But also, now go back to now establish a few things. In Jerusalem and the surrounding area. Ezra and Nehemiah are books that could be read together. Look at it as one volume. They know that the return of the exiles from Babylon in three different groups or three different movements. We read by the Zerubbabel, who are divorced to rebuild the temple because the Babylonians had destroyed it in 587 586. 
the pronouncing covert action of God on the lives of his people that actually serve to preserve them. We are not just giving the earth and 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 the earth so that we could hear what we needed to hear and do what we needed to do so that we could be right with him. So that people could come to know the Lord. In the book of Esther, Christ is our person, our counselor, and our advocate. He's the one that stands up and makes the way when it doesn't seem to be a way. He speaks up for us. So there you have it. 17 books of history in a nutshell. Why did you come and lead us in song? So I just like to say. I recognize the fact that we covered a lot of material tonight, and I hope that you take this booklet and you look over it and you prepare for next week because I'll use it. So bring it back for next week. And we'll go on with the story, and that will also help us with the questions. Now, what I don't want us to do, if you'd stand with me, what I don't want us to do is I don't want us to get so carried away with the book itself and the story itself that we miss the awesomeness of God and His kingdom in the midst of the great So, what I'm going to do
Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for bringing us to this place tonight, Lord, where we can hear your word spoken through Pastor Joe. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for all the blessings that you've given us. Lord, there's so many things going in in so many lives right now. Lord, there are those that have health problems. There are those that have job problems, people that are having issues with marriage, with their finances. But God, we know that you are in charge. You are in control of everything. Be the leader of our life, Lord. Be our light every day. We love you. We praise your name, Jesus. Amen. You are dismissed.